Welcome to the Sound Off Show. My name is Linda Kirker. I host the program, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate that. I would like to start the program tonight with a very short prayer. I think during these troubling times with so many issues out there and people struggling and people isolated and uh, jobs gone away temporarily, I hope, uh, a lot of struggles going on in this country and around the world. And so I would like to offer up just a brief prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful for your inspiration. Your benevolence led our founders to create one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Please grant today's leaders the courage and perseverance to protect our Constitution and preserve our nation as a nation of God. Amen. And the second thing I would like to start the program with tonight is to share with you a, um, a more brief version of a poem that I shared some time ago, something I was inspired to write on May 18th of 2018. I came across it when I was going through some papers, and I said, you know what, I would like to share this at this time. So here we go. I'm grateful to live in the land of the free, a gift that was given to you and to me by the founding fathers, heroes all who pledged their fortunes and their lives so that they and their descendants could happily thrive with individual rights, freedoms, and opportunities galore. Now, we wonder what our future holds and what is in store. We are faced with a similar fight to preserve and protect our precious rights and to teach American history to our youth to their delight. For they are the future defenders of all that makes America great. There is no room for divisiveness, bitterness, and hate. For united we stand, divided we fall. The questions we must ask are, will our Constitution be revered? Do we have the will and the courage to stand up and fight to preserve America's unique blessings with all of our might? Let there be light from above to guide us and the love of God to strengthen us. May God bless America, our flag, and our national anthem, and all who serve and strive to protect and honor them in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you for listening. Not that you had a choice if you had the show on. <laughs> but anyway, welcome to the program. Uh, tonight, I have a brand new guest on the show. After all these years, he's not been on until tonight. And I'm happy to introduce him. His name is Ron Lawrence. Welcome aboard, Ron. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm glad to have you. Just getting to know you a little bit tonight. And... Um, Ron, I, I would like it if you would share with the viewers a little bit about yourself. I know you're, you live in, in uh, Essex, and you're the Essex Town Republican Chairman. Yes. And you're self-employed. I am. Why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about that and, and other things about yourself? Well, uh, I am self-employed. I've had a, uh, a product in a company called Publisher's Assistant. Uh, I've been doing this for about 30 years now. Um, I work with independent publishers. It's, uh, it's a combination of technologies, but at the heart of it is an accounting system uh, that, uh, that deals specifically with, the, with things in the publishing industry. Um, other than that, uh, yes, I've been involved in town. I've, uh, I'm a former uh, school board member. Good. Um, I, um, I'm a musician. Oh, you are. You didn't tell me that. I've been a musician for, you know, again, over 30 years now. What do you play? 
Uh, I play the guitar. Uh, oh. the, the band is called the Jericho Road Crew. Oh, great. Uh, we get a lot of laughs about that, but uh, our, our, we originated in the Covenant Church uh, back in 1988. 88? 1988. Well, that's a few years ago. A couple years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's fun. I love music. I sang in a, a mixed barbershop quartet with a, a husband that I had at one time. And, um, Green Mountain we, Chorus, by any chance? I sang in the women's barbershop chorus. Okay. As he sang in the men's barbershop chorus. And then um, he approached another couple who were also in the choruses and wanted to know if they would be willing to sing with us. I, I always loved to sing in choruses but throughout my life, but I never knew barbershop music. Yeah. And that is unique. It is. It's, um, it's something to learn. <laughs> but my grandfather was a barbershopper. What was that? He was? My grandfather was a no barbershopper. No kidding. Yes, he was. It, where? The Green Mountain Chorus. Um, and I was part of a, a group called the... Uh, Oh, was it the Jericho? It was an octet. Um, oh, now I've, an the octet? name escapes me. Yeah, it was, it was a, a group that uh, that came from Jericho that, that sang oh, together for years. Oh, it is such fun. And um, to have a chance to entertain people mm -hmm. and, and to have fun at the same time, yeah. you know, it was great. But I had a big learning curve. Because uh, barbershop singing is very different. <laughs> but, well, there you go. My dad played piano. I grew up with p beautiful piano music. Oh, that's great. It's, yeah, it was a gift. I'm, uh, I'm also a woodworker. Oh. Uh, so you mentioned the piano. I've got a, a baby grand piano. It's a project. <gasps> that's what my dad had. Yeah, it's a, well, mine's in pieces. <laughs> it's, it's a what? It's in pieces. I'm, I've got it torn apart uh, and restoring it. I've just replaced all the keys on the keyboard. And, uh, oh, my. Uh, so I, working with wood, I figured uh, if I was ever going to have a baby grand piano, I was going to have to get a fixer-upper, and that's what I got. <laughs> Good for you. Oh, I, I was, it was a gift to my youth. Mm -hmm. I used to tap dance. My dad would play f for me so I could tap dance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he played <clears throat> um, so, like Clear de Lune and, and a lot of the more, what do you call them? Very traditional tunes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The that great stuff. Mm -hmm. I was blessed. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that interesting? I didn't know that. You see, you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> so... Um, you, how long have you lived in Essex? Well, <clears throat> it looks like Jericho, to be honest with you. Uh, I, my grandparents have owned a farm in Jericho since I think around 1940. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, the property that we have built a house on uh, is straight up the hill from them. And uh, it's just over the Essex town line. So, ah. Uh, the, the town line literally cuts through our driveway. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. So you you live there now? We do. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, there's so much going on following the recent elections and um, within the state of Vermont as well as nationally. Mm -hmm. There's there's just so much to keep up with and to m much of it is disturbing and and um, difficult to swallow. Um, especially when you believe the way I believe. I'm a big believer in the founding documents of this country, the U.S. Constitution, Agree with the Bill of Rights, and so forth. Yeah. And um, I, I just have no understanding why there are groups and individuals who rebel against those founding documents that have given us so much in this country. Can you explain that? Uh, I think the, the simple answer is that they just don't understand them. They haven't been taught what those founding documents are and what they mean. You know, the structure that our founding fathers set up is unbelievable. It is, uh, it is beautifully balanced and uh, I'm sure you've, you've read a lot of history yourself and uh, I'm just amazed at the the depth of the study of the of the founding fathers as they put together the, the Constitution. 
Um, and, uh, you know, this last election, uh, I'm not happy with the outcome, but no. the, the things that happened on January 6th were spelled out in the Constitution. Okay, our founding fathers foresaw a situation where an election would be contested, and these are the measures that uh, they put in place in order to resolve those, mm -hmm. those conflicts. So um, it, it is amazing to me that they had that kind of foresight. That they have what? That kind of foresight. Oh, yes. Well, they came from, many, most of them, I would say, came from circumstances where they didn't feel free mm -hmm. under King George III. And so he was a tyrant, and, and they didn't feel free. They couldn't practice their own religion. They were highly taxed, and they had it up to here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the courage that it must have taken to... You take that for granted today, yes, don't we? Yes, to leave that home country and to hop on a small ship and to come across the ocean to this country. And then they had no homes, they had no food, they had, you know, I mean, they were starting from the very beginning. Yes. And as, it, as they developed through the process that they had to go through, when they eventually got to the place where they were forming a government, um, they wanted to make sure that they provided freedom for the individual and not government control of everything, right. which is what socialism is. When I spoke to the 7th and 8th graders a couple of times, I was blessed to be invited to do that, would love to do it again. I told the students that socialism is about controlling your life. It's not freedom. It winds up being that way, yes. <clears throat> I know that the popular uh, sentiment about socialism these days seems to be, well, it, it make, you know, everybody's the same. Everybody gets uh, treated equally. But of course, it's, it's got a fallacy. I mean, in order to, to be able to distribute things equally, somebody has to do the distribution. And, and somebody, so somebody has to do charge. somebody has to do the work so that there is something to distribute. Right, and it, it causes all kinds of disincentives to be productive. But what kind of motivation or stimulation or excitement comes from being given everything, mm -hmm. or or um, just not not having the the motivation and, and the independence and, and the opportunity to create as much as you are capable of creating. Yeah. And then if you get to a point where you have created a lot, you have the option and the joy of help giving things to people to help them maybe to become more independent. And creating opportunities. Sure. Yes, yeah, but absolutely. didn't didn't the founders know that if we the people, after they created our government, where we were free and independent, they knew that if we were not vigilant about what was going on in our country and involved in government, that we would lose what they had given us. And our young people today are not being taught in our schools about civics, U.S. history, the founding yeah. documents. Do you remember in school, uh, I mean, first of all, when did you start learning about the three branches of government, for example, and the structure? I was in the eighth grade. You were in the eighth I, I remember getting some of this stuff as early as the fifth grade. Okay. I remember uh, a fifth grade teacher was who was great on... Uh, she, she taught us not only the, the branches of government, but the, the concept of the balance of power. Um, <clears throat> and I also remember um, she taught a lot about what was going on in, in uh, the communist countries. Uh, really? Yes. It, it was, there was a lot of discussion about what, what that meant, what life was like in Russia or in China. So you got so. A, a sense of uh, the differences between freedom and 
and being under the force of government. Yeah, you got to remember that this is fifth grade, and you know not everything is appropriate for fifth graders. Right. But uh, uh, at, at the same time, there was an, there was definitely an impression left that uh, you know, we we have something special here, and uh, um, they don't have that everywhere in the world. Amen to that, and and that was a gift and a blessing that you learned that at an early age. I can, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you know, one of the great gifts that we have, Ron, is opportunity. If you if you're willing to take the bull by the horns and work. Work is a good four-letter word, as I told the students. <laughs> they laughed, like yeah. you are. Yeah. But it is. It's a good <clears throat> four-letter word. And work gives you opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I was taught work, as I've said on this show a number of times. I, I was taught work from being this, this age, young. Yeah. And I better do a good job. Yeah, you have, I to, heard you have about to contribute. It. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's also uh, an element of, of this that uh, I I wouldn't mind touching on, which is sure. the entrepreneurial spirit. Yes. Um, I've been a uh, I've been self-employed for for a long time. Um, one of the things that I did was I had a woodworking business for uh, nine years. Uh, and it focused on architectural products. Uh, architectural? Yes, uh, fireplace mantles, wainscoting, built-in. Oh, nice, uh, decorative. Yes, very, and all kind of a, of a historical nature. So for me, it, it, I immersed myself in uh, um, you know, colonial architecture uh, and learned a lot about what what those designs were, why they were made the way they were. Yeah, and even the wood. You know, the when we settled this country, uh, well, there were people here. We had we do have to re remember that. Oh sure, the Indians um, <clears throat> were here, and uh, they had a way of uh, caring for the land that actually kept the forests open for uh, for their own ability to hunt. Uh, and that meant that there were some big, beautiful trees uh, to be had to um, to take down, and and the the big big old pine trees that were just clear of knots. They were uh, easy to work. It was it's just uh, you know it, it, it's hard to imagine because it's just not available to us anymore. But uh, there's a lot of history there. Yes, there is, and it's important for our youth to learn all of it. Yeah. Um, However, um, unfortunately, uh, I haven't been in the classrooms myself, but what, what I'm told is that there's a lot of negativism about the early years of this country. And um, yeah, there were, there were things that weren't always positive. Uh, I, but I can tell you that firsthand. I mean, I, I remember our kids bringing home ideas that were not, the, the thoughts were not uh, things that make you proud to be an American. They were things that sort of brought on shame. And when you're, you're talking about elementary grade kids, um, that's, that's a big impression. And just you like bet. I was talking about my fifth grade experience, you know, my kids saw something very different in school. Yes, the negatives. <clears throat> and um, the negatives though, grew into positives. We, um, we learned a lesson from those things. And, and things changed. Okay? There are no slaves in, that I know of in this country now. Um, maybe there's a different type of slavery. Yeah. yeah I'm, unfortunately, I think there's oppression, you know, that, that still Is goes it on. intentional, to, though? Well, if it's uh, if someone's being oppressed, someone is is uh, um, doing it. Somebody's trying to control someone else, and, and we want to eradicate that anywhere we can. Yes, and and what's so great about the country, though, <clears throat> is that to to the best of my knowledge, I'm not everywhere in every state, every corner of every state, but there is an opportunity for children to go to school. Mm -hmm. Now, what the quality of the school is, is, is another story, okay? 
but I, I firmly believe that our young people need to be taught work ethic because that's how you get ahead in life mm -hmm. is to learn to work whatever your choice of profession or you know there is certainly something that's that's missing um, <clears throat> I, I think that you and I grew up in a time when there was a belief that if you work hard, you will get ahead. You will, you will improve your life. Uh, I'm afraid that these days it feels like there's sort of an expectation that someone should take care of me. Okay, that uh, I may need to work for a living or so forth, but, but, but uh, there's sort of this expectation that uh, I'm owed a job or I'm owed um, you know, a minimum wage, or I'm owed, uh, um, you know, things that 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 you know are necessary to live, uh, and it somehow uh, absolves me of being responsible for those things myself. Yes, and but there's also a a focus, and I will call call out socialism again, um, because. I believe the people who believe in socialism as a way of life uh, don't want people to be really independent. Mm. They want them dependent on government. I do think that that is a political tactic that is at work these days. I, I agree with you. I don't think that the rank and file um, people of our country really think that way. But I do think that there is a concerted effort in our political systems to create some dependencies so that you know you know who you're going to vote for in the next election. Uh, it's, it's insidious. It's uh, planting seeds in their minds like discoloring the, the true founding of our country. Uh, to make it more negative than positive. Yeah. And then, oh, well, this isn't a good country, you know. Well, yes, it is, because you're here now, mm -hmm. and you have an opportunity. Yeah. And are you going to take it, or are you <clears throat> going to let it slide? It's a, it's a country founded on the idea that uh, um, the individual has rights and, and freedom. Uh, and therefore, you can take risks. You know, we were talking about the entrepreneurial spirit a, a while ago. Um, I, <laughs> I just, uh, I, there's a story that I want to get to. I, 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 when I started my woodworking business, I, uh, I went and talked to some other people who were in a similar business. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, a background in manufacturing. Uh, I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation for, for nine years. Um, as an engineer. Um, but I was talking to uh, a man named John Solinger. He uh, had uh, the Vermont Sled Company. I don't know if okay. you remember that. Um, they started out making sleds, but they, were, they became famous for the, uh, the Holstein uh, stools. Oh. Uh, do you remember those? They're, they're painted like Holstein cows, and uh, um, you know, they, they produced a lot of them. It was, it was uh, you know, quite well known for a while there. Uh-huh. But I was talking to John, he was very kind to me and showed me the operation and, uh, and we were talking about the risk of going into business. And he, he said to me, yeah, but uh, you know, if, it were, if I was broke and my, I was out of business and I was, it was raining and I was lying in the gutter, he said I'd be lying there thinking about starting a new business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I admire people who have the gumption, the belief in themselves, the, 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 um, the comfort in, in taking a risk. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of things that are risky. Yeah. But it's not if, always comfortable either. <laughs> no, they're not always comfortable. But <clears throat> if you have an idea and you believe in it and you think it has value, mm -hmm. either for yourself or for the market, then why not give it a shot? Yeah. You know, it has to make sense. Well, honestly, there's lots of reasons why people don't give it a shot. And uh, one of the things that has developed over the years is that there, there's so much regulation. There's so much um, with the, in, 
giving giving our our uh, government, our collective government, the benefit of the doubt. It's with the intention of protecting, you know, our citizenry. But they create situations where the barriers are so high that an individual can't uh, can't go into a particular area of business because the cost is just too great, we, or the ahead. regulations are, are are so stringent that they they just can't possibly do it. We had a perfect example of that not long ago, uh, a year or so ago, in Vermont. And that is, we had a number of private daycares. Yes. And families chose the daycare provider. They were comfortable with that person or those individuals who were running the daycare. It was maybe convenient in the locale where they lived and they could afford it. Mm -hmm. And it was going well, as far as I know. And then all of a sudden, the state put all these regulations on them yep. that created costs for them and other difficulties. And many of them said, we're done. Yeah. We're not doing this anymore. And lo and behold. Now we have a daycare crisis. Now the three and four year olds are in the school system. Yes. Now you tell me that wasn't the motivation in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's. You know, <clears throat> I uh, there's no doubt in my mind. I remember I was on the school board when uh, this started. Uh, we we were making the decision whether to go to all day kindergarten. Um, now I'm of the opinion that uh, we wanted to keep our kids home as long as we could. We just sure. wanted the you know wanted them to have that home experience and to, and to be with them. And all education starts at home. That's right. I I feel that way. Um, I do too. The uh, the education of our children is our the parents' responsibility. We may send them to school to have them educated, you know, yes. the school to perform that service for us. But it's our responsibility to make sure that our kids are educated. Boy, did I get educated at home? <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, I learned work ethic at a very young age, and and my mom was tough. Mm -hmm. She was loving, but she was tough. Yeah. And she checked to see what kind of a job I did. There you go. And so I had to be accountable for the kind of job I did. The work ethic was built into me from a very young age. And that has been a gift from heaven. Thank you, Mom. Um, as I've gone through my life, because you build up a certain level of confidence. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and skills. Pardon me? And skills. And too. skill. Yeah. And so when the tough times come, you you have this sense, no matter how hard it is, that I have to find my way through this. Yes. And that is a gift. And parents can give that. Parents, you can give that to your children. Yeah. Teach them work ethic within a reasonable framework, depending on their age. Yeah, there, that's another interesting point that uh, um, one in, of our Essex Republicans made. Uh, he, he expressed that one of the things that feels like it's missing is, you know, we've we've had such an emphasis on on building our children's self-esteem in school uh, that uh, we haven't really given them the tools that they need to cope when things get difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you think the school should do that? Um, yes, I do. I, I think that uh, uh, it, it, it's one, one of the things about this is that um, I think that there's a bit of a breakdown between our schools and parents and, and the raising of our children. Okay. Years ago, I think there was a, a fundamental trust between parents and schools. Yes. Uh, and I and I feel that that has been eroded. Okay. I, I agree with you. Now, again, there are many wonderful teachers, and I know that many parents have a great relationship with their children's teachers. I really don't mean to diminish that. No. But I think that it's become such an institution. The system is yeah, broken. That uh, the, you know, the parents are not always aware of what's going on with their kids in the school, 
and the school doesn't really have parents backing them up when it comes to dealing with the issues schools, with their children. The schools, as I understand it, don't really want the parents to know what the kids are learning in school. When, when the children were home and being taught on the computer, mm -hmm. you know, from the school, yeah. um, it, it was said more than once that the schools didn't want the parents to see what the kids were learning on the computer. Yeah, I don't know how, how widespread that is, but I've I heard the same thing. I don't okay. know either. I, I think parents became a lot more aware of what their kids were being taught. When they when they had to do go to this remote learning when they can't do simple <clears throat> math again you know I know it's easy to paint this with a very broad brush in some ways I think the schools are instructing kids in ways that you know we just never got I mean they're doing some phenomenal things I also think that they're missing some very basic things basics things. absolutely you know and and uh, as I said children. there's a there's in terms of our history and, and our identity as a people I I am getting the feeling that uh, instead of a sense of pride being taught to our children it's a sense of shame uh, I, I think agree. that's a huge mistake look at all the young people who are I'm talking like uh, high school and college age mm -hmm. uh, who are you know think this country is not a good thing they haven't been taught how lucky they are to live in a country where you're free to be right so far right we'll see what happens going forward but you mentioned something, Ron, um, about minimum wage. Sure. Yeah. Um, it it kind of goes along with the with the sense of um, some you know our government should take care of us. Okay. Uh, I I think that you know raising the minimum wage is a mistake for a number of reasons. Uh, oh. It, it takes the market out of it. It winds up, I think, eliminating jobs for teenagers. That's mm -hmm. their entry level job. That's mm -hmm. where they begin to learn mm -hmm. that work ethic and begin to develop those skills. Uh, if those jobs are gone uh, or, or they're dependent on an internship where they're not really being paid for it, they don't really have, they, they miss out on a lot. They, I agree. Um, I worked in a bakery on Saturdays if I wasn't if there wasn't a football game and I wasn't cheerleading <laughs> uh, in high school um, uh, anyway um, it's not the role of government to tell a private employer how much to pay their employees that is private enterprise we have to get the government out of that and if you and I were working side by side in a private business and we both had the same responsibilities mm -hmm. and I came in late most of the time and I did the bare you minimum. Do that, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just use make creating a scenario I here. And um, I did the bare minimum mm -hmm. of work. I couldn't wait to get out of there, okay? And you beside me came in early, you made suggestions to your employer about things that you see maybe could be improved. Uh, you try to help out and you're very productive, all right? And we're both getting paid the same amount of money mm -hmm. per hour. How are you gonna feel when you see me sloughing off and doing half the work that you're doing but getting paid just as much? Right. Are you going to stay there? <clears throat> or, you know, it's just not right. It, it creates a lot of disincentives, that's for sure. Um, and if that situation is not recognized and, or I'm, I'm not feeling uh, like I'm being valued for the things that I am contributing, exactly. I'd probably look for a different job. I would you too. Know, the, the, the thing is, if you uh, are in a situation where that's not an option for you, um, you know, you, you've mentioned socialism a, a, a couple of times here, but if you have a situation where we're essentially all working for the government, then uh, uh, you may not have those options anymore, and getting ahead becomes a whole lot more difficult. 
Well, yeah, there, because there are controls. Um, we have to let private businesses thrive. It's, it's true, you know, <clears throat> if I'm hiring someone and I'm paying them minimum wage for the skill that, that I've, I've hired them for, um, a number of things happen. That for, the first thing is that if I've got good people and I want to hang on to them, then I'm probably going to pay them more. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't always happen that way, and those people, if they are are uh, well skilled and and self confident, they're probably going to go look for another job anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. So, if I want to hang on to those people, I, I as a business owner, I would certainly recognize that these people are going to need uh, more compensation to keep them here. Well, and the other thing is, if the government is assuming the role of determining what what people are going to get paid in your business. Mm -hmm. That's not right. That that just isn't right. That's not the role of government. I I I totally agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, I think the the message that others grab onto is <clears throat> you know, it's too difficult for me to get ahead, so uh, you know, Pay me, the, more, pay me yeah, more than I'm worth? If I can get the, cover, the, the government to uh, mandate that I get paid more, then, uh, then that's, that's... Where's the incentive for the sluffer, the one who doesn't really work hard to earn the money they're getting? Where's the incentive for them to become a better employee? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can answer that question there for you. Cause, there is none. There is none. I think that you know, going down that road, as, as you're alluding to, uh, it creates a lot of disincentives. It uh, creates a situation where you're not rewarded for uh, some, some uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, if you, if you want to apply yourself, if, if you, uh, you want to get ahead in life, then uh, you should have the, the ability and the freedom to do so. You know, um, I, I, another topic just popped into my head, and that is uh, what's going on with policing today. Um, I, I'm a big supporter <clears throat> and proponent, not only of our law enforcement, uh, at, you know, local and, and state and sheriff's departments, as well as our, our military. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a big believer and supporter, and I believe that they need to be respected and they need to be appreciated. It's not that there might not be a, a, a single incident of wrongdoing along the way, but that doesn't create, um, shouldn't create a problem for the whole force. Right. Okay? Right. Not everybody's perfect all the time. And sometimes there, there may be circumstances where the, the officer feels threatened. You know, you just never know what, what's gone on. But No, that's, that's true. We, we recognize that not everyone in our society, even, even well-intentioned, law-abiding people, can sometimes get on each other's nerves, okay? And, couples, uh, couples get on one another's <laughs> nerves. <laughs> um, and we have, in order to keep the, the law, in order to keep people... Um, Under control. And, and respecting one another, you need to have somebody to enforce the law. Of course. Okay, and so we've asked these people to step in to, and we've, we've entrusted them with a certain amount of force uh, in order to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take those tools away from them, when you, when you get into dangerous situations where people are, you know, are hot under the collar or, or doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. Destroying um, property. Destroying property. Uh, taking down historic statues. Or using mean? violence against one another. Uh, any of these things. And, and uh, you tie the officer's hands uh, it keeps them from being able to do, and it, and it keeps them from taking a risk that they yes. might otherwise do to step in to stop exactly. a situation. So it's, I totally agree with you that uh, uh, these people are our uh, police force. Um, they deserve our respect. Yes, they do. And I've been wondering about what we could do, like through different, like 
counties or whatever to show our respect or to find out from uh, the sheriff's office or, or the state police or the local police, what is it that you need? Mm -hmm. You know, do, are there things that you need to protect yourselves with, for instance, that you don't have the budget for, whatever? Can we hold a fundraiser for you? You know, whatever. Uh, to let them know that they're not alone. There are police forces like Burlington. They have either let go of a, a number of their police force or or the police policemen themselves have just said they're done. Right. You know, so how does that protect the people and, and enforce the laws and so forth? I, I think that the city of Burlington is, is working through those things now. Uh, I think that they are, their police force, I, I, I have to believe that uh, they're, they're somewhat demoralized. I know when all this stuff started happening uh, with, with the whole uh, uh, defund the police uh, mantra oh. and, and so forth, um, I made a point of contacting our Essex police chief to ask him that question. I said, "What is it that you know we citizens can can do to uh, to support our police force and let you know that we uh, we do stand behind you?" Um, and you know his his answer was very practical. One, uh, a just writing an email and letting them know I think you know raises their spirits. Uh, that Little. by itself, and then there's the practical things of you know when your your town or your city is uh, passing a budget, you make sure that the police uh, budget is is what it needs to be. Um, so, uh, I think those are things that uh, that all of us can do. You know, it's we need to be aware of and uh, to think about. I have a, I have. I'm a note taker, so I have notes all over my kitchen counter, <laughs> to-do lists, and and um, my intention is to reach out. We have a new police chief up here, and I haven't met him yet, but I, I want to. And I've been to visit the sheriff to sit down and talk with him. Yep. And um, I, I think that they need to know that we're behind them yep. and respect them. <clears throat> it's interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, I told you, we we just took this trip to D.C. on uh, yes. January sixth. Yes. Uh, when I first Tell heard about, about that, uh, I I thought immediately, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'd really like to find a way to get there. Uh, our president asked us to come down to uh, be there on that on on that day uh, for the certification vote that was happening in in the Senate. Um, so uh, it, I found out that there was a contingent here in Vermont that was organizing a, friend, a mutual friend of ours, Ellie Martin, was yes. organizing a bus. And uh, so I jumped in to see if I could help with, with that organization. We filled up a bus pretty quickly. Uh, and we, uh, we took the trip down to D.C. on you know, yes. we started the night of the 5th and we got home 4 o'clock in the morning on the uh, 6th, <laughs> uh, or the 7th actually. Um, so it was quite a trek. Um, and the feeling when we got there, first of all, the area around the mall um, was almost deserted. There was nobody on the streets except police officers and some guards. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the crowd that went down to D.C. for this thing, we love the police. <laughs> we sure. love the guards. Sure. So this was not an intimidation at all for us. In fact, I, I took some pictures. I, asked, I, I ran into a group of guardsmen. I asked if I could take their picture, and we chatted for a bit. And uh, it was, you know, you know, the police were, were you know, wishing us well on the way uh, um, there was no buses, no traffic or anything in the streets, so... Uh, um, you had to walk quite a distance, we did. as we, I understand it. We did have to walk quite a ways, and, and uh, there are several older folks uh, in our group, so uh, getting down and getting back was uh, a little bit of a concern. But at any rate, it, it, was, it was a wonderful event. Uh, it was, it was a, around, uh, between the Washington Monument and the Ellipse was where the presentations were taking place. 
I had the feeling before we left that I wasn't going to be able to see or hear anything, and uh -huh. I was I was right about that. Even though there was a huge screen and there was a big sound system there, the echo in the sound system was so bad that uh, you really couldn't even make out what people were saying. You uh, so so it, did you not? Were you not able to hear what the president said? Well, it turns out that by the time the president was speaking, our small group uh, was making our way back to Union Station. And somebody caught it on the phone. It was being streamed on the phone, and so we had much better. <laughs> okay. We could hear the president better than we heard anything else that morning. Uh, but it, most of the day for me personally was uh, trying to round up people on the bus, trying to get us back together. I was looking through the crowds for these folks. Uh, we had a small group that, that we managed to stay together, but it was people standing toe to toe. The whole day, uh, it was cold. The wind was uh, unrelenting, mm -hmm. and uh, and yet, you know, we're bumping into each other, and we're saying, "Excuse me," and we're trying to get through, <laughs> and and people are smiling, and where are you from? And I'm from so and so, and and it was it was friendly. And it was incredibly friendly. Yeah. Uh, it was just an amazing uh, thing to experience. Well, I heard what uh, what was recorded of what the president said to go peacefully right, and to make your voices heard. This is the thing, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks who are not happy with the way President Trump speaks, okay, mm -hmm. uh, the, the way that uh, he, uh, but people who follow him, people who listen to him, they know what he means, they yes. know what he's talking about. We're not trying to you know, interpret or whatever. No, there's no way that anything I heard was uh, um, inciting a riot or, or inciting the, uh, no. the storming of the Capitol building. But there are people, I, I read um, and saw on TV, um, a former, I don't know if he was military or former police officer, um, said that he saw a busload of people come in yeah, um, es escorted by uh, the police, no less. Uh, uh -huh. I've heard similar stories. I can't, you know, vouch for them. You didn't personally. see them. I didn't see that. No. As a matter of fact, uh, um, before the the president was done speaking, uh, like I said, our small group was making our way back to Union Station. Uh, we were just so exhausted you didn't go at the time. To I didn't actually. We we have to sort of pass by the Capitol building. Uh, just to give you an indication, one of our, um, in our group, uh, suggested that we stop and actually say a prayer over the Capitol building, which we did. Uh, we didn't actually walk up to the Capitol building. We, we were sort of heading off in, a, in a, another direction at that point, but we, but we were going down Constitution Ave, and, and the Capitol building is right there. So, mm -hmm. um, so th that was our experience. Um, we, it wasn't until later when we, when our group, our bus uh, uh, group started uh, collecting again that we heard that there were some people that did go to the Capitol and they did see some of the commotion. And to my knowledge, there was nobody that participated in it, but, uh, um, but and the, the feeling on the bus on the way back was, this was a great event, uh, the thing at the Capitol was not good. It, uh, it really no, put a damper on the no, whole thing. No, uh, of course not. Um, but if you watched as um, the videos of the people uh, breaking the breaking windows and and uh, climbing into the uh, Capitol building, um, they didn't look like they looked like Antifa to me. I think, from what I've heard. <clears throat> um, and, I, and I've looked for first-hand accounts and different sources, uh, several different first-hand accounts. Uh, and one of them was a cameraman. He was taking video of uh, what was going on. All of them had the conclusion that, uh, that this was pre-planned. People came with equipment, came with ideas. Absolutely. That... Um, Th this was something that was in the works long before the president ever spoke. And why? And why wasn't? Why weren't there Capitol Police? Well, there were, but the but the accounts that I've heard said that uh, there were not nearly enough. No. And there, and as one guy put it, it wasn't exactly the A team. Okay. Yeah. It was. 
uh, a group of people that were put there uh, and just ill prepared for the situation. Uh, and you, you have to wonder, you know, whether that was purposeful or the the whole thing was a. Uh, um, it was it was staged, you know. Th from the time that we arrived, the uh, police force on on the streets, the traffic being blocked off, uh, the, all the restaurants. There was no facilities anywhere. Uh, there were places that were boarded up. You know, there had been a, a riot there weeks before. So you couldn't get any food, or you couldn't get any food. You, wow. You. Uh, you <laughs> I just remember there was one place where there were a bunch of portalettes that were lined up outside of a tent, and uh, there was nobody in the tent, and uh, somebody rattled the door of the portalette, and, uh, and it was locked. Oh, my. Okay, so <laughs> he just shouted out, thanks a lot, DC, you know. Um, it was it, it was clearly an unwelcoming situation, I think, set out by the mayor. Uh, F knowing that this uh, this uh, um, event was going to take place, uh, so that's, that's okay. I mean, we did it. We 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 walked. We we gathered, and like I say, I, my experience was it was just a wonderful gathering. Um, well, that's that's good to hear. Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad I did it. Uh, I'm I'm uh, happy to have helped make it possible for some other people to go and and. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate that the whole thing is, has taken this nasty turn. Yes, it is, and I, I'm i one who believes that it was all planned in advance for that to happen. Well, apparently the FBI has said the same thing. The so. FBI thinks so, too. Yeah. And then, um, you know, who gets blamed for it? Oh, of course. Trump. Yeah. That poor man went <clears throat> through so much from even before he won the election. Yes. Uh, the these people, for them, he couldn't do anything right. Yeah. And I have to say, uh, you know, for me personally, I was kind of a, a reluctant uh, supporter. You know, he was the Republican nominee, and I'm a good Republican, so I, you know, supported his candidacy in 2016. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a believer at this point. I mean, the man told us what he was going to do. And he, and he did, he did it. it. Okay, that by itself, I think, deserves recognition. Well, I hope recognition. that's not the case with the current president, <laughs> because what he's telling us he's going to do is frightening. Yes. And, and the things that he's already done are, yes, are frightening. Yes, all of those um, executive orders that yeah. he signed. Yeah, well, this is back to what we were talking about before. You know, our, our governments are basically run by committee. And those committees essentially work for the executive branch. So that's how it's possible for a president to write these executive uh, uh, orders and, and you know, put them in place. Uh, unfortunately, that also means that you know, the next president can come along and undo everything that, that one president has done. Yeah, uh, well, um, we have all of these committees like um, the Climate Council. Yes. Um, 23 members, unelected people, make up this Climate Council for the Global Warming Solutions Act, okay? Yes. And um, <clears throat> it know, is I, I just want to say about that, I know that there are a lot of people who are really concerned about our climate, about our, our uh, um, environment, and some have have said uh, that we've got to do something. You know, we've got to take some sort of step forward, and this is it for them. You know, they were just happy to see it. But what they don't realize is what this bill actually did. I mean, yes, it sets up this committee, but it's it's as if the legislature has just completely washed their hands of having to enact anything that's difficult in order to. They transferred the responsibility totally, to unelected people. Yes. And, that and is, so that they're, they're not accountable for whatever it is that group puts in place. That's right. And then there's um, the Green Mountain Care Board for health care yes. with a $1.46 billion budget. Yep. All right? Green Mountain Care Board. Let the hospitals, you know, they have the hospitals now pooled together. Mm -hmm. All right? 
Which, under the medical center in Burlington. There are a number of them all working in concert, all part of this One Care Vermont. But... <laughs> And it makes it more difficult for independent clinics to, exactly. to operate as well. And, <clears throat> and there are all these regulations. Again, free enterprise is being... Uh, squelched. What? Squelched. Squelched. Yeah, yes. that's a good word. Um, and, of course, education is statewide, too. Yeah, it's a monopoly. And we need to get back to community schools. I agree. This... Uh, um, it's it's interesting because in Essex, I actually supported the merger of the school districts, um, and that's because Essex has got this you know dual personality. We got the the, the uh, Essex Junction Village. Oh, I know. And we got that's the town where I lived. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we had four different school districts, you know, in that in that area, including Westford. Um, now. If uh, I had had my, if I had been a Westford resident, I'm not sure I would have, uh, you know, jumped in with the Essex merger. But nonetheless, uh, it seemed to make sense to me that we should be one town, one one district, uh, and manage our school resources all all together. Um, but it's called competition. Well, <clears throat> the, here's the thing, though. I mean, you look at every single town and the schools that that town has raised money to build. Okay. Raising money to build? Yes. Um, so now uh, we've been consolidating school districts all over the state. And so you're essentially saying to these towns, you know, that school that you built, that you paid for. Isn't yours. It isn't yours. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, you, you've, you've just sold it to the, the deal in Essex was we sold our schools for a dollar. And uh, there's a period of time where the, the town could buy those facilities back if the, if the school district decided they, they, they didn't need a building, uh, they, could, they could buy it sold back. Sold to but whom? The, the, I think the transfer, the actual transfer of ownership of our schools went to the school district, the new consolidated school district, and it was it was a uh, you know a token. Uh, oh, so the people in the community don't have to pay taxes to support it anymore? It's oh no no they they do. <laughs> of course they do. But they. I'm don't talking know. about the but but the the asset of the of the buildings. Okay, and the grounds, the all the belong to the school. They belong to the new school district. They were all transferred from individual school districts there to the new again. consolidated school district. Consolidation um, again. No more independence. Now, again, in Essex, my personal feeling uh, was that this was a move in the right direction because I, I would prefer to see us be one community. But if I were living in a school district that covered a bunch of towns, uh, and these and these things were, uh, you know, this is my school that my kids went to, and and we've been paying for uh, to keep up all these years, um, I'd be a little upset. Uh huh. Yeah. So. I lived in Essex Junction. And I fought for Essex Junction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we would have some interesting conversations yes, around we that, would. I'm sure. <laughs> well, listen, I hope you'll come on again. We're down to a minute and 50 seconds. Oh, my goodness. Where does the time go? Oh, and we have a caller. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Caller, quickly, what's on your mind? Hey, long time watcher, first time caller. Oh, thank you. I'm reading a, a piece from former President Trump's secretary, acting secretary. Um, of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf. Okay. And he uh, said that the violence at the Capitol was, uh, is unacceptable. They're violent actions and they're unconscionable, and the president was responsible for those. This is Trump's own acting secretary, or was his own acting secretary. I wanted to know if you both would join in that condemnation of the political attack incited by Donald Trump, a political attack that was perpetrated by Trump supporters, white supremacist, insurrectionists. <laughs> and I was curious if you could do that. Thanks. I would love to speak to that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Quickly. We definitely condemn the violence, okay? It's really unclear who is responsible for it still. Why would the president do that? That's ridiculous. I don't think the president had any incentive to do that. No. And neither did the supporters of the president. Why would they want to do that? That's no. nonsense. So I, there's part of your assertion that I agree with. The violence is unacceptable. 
the the uh, part that uh, attempts to place blame with the president, I think, is, is false. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for answering the question. Thank you, caller, for chiming in. And uh, we're down to a, a 10, nine, nine seconds now. <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me. Ron, yeah. This has been fun. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> I do, too. Bye, folks. See you again next week with John Clark as my guest. Good night. <laughs>